around recently, you know we have been so busy. And so we wanna say thank you to everyone who showed up last Sunday to pack bags for our annual community egg hunt and everyone who came yesterday to help at the egg hunt and everyone who's helped over the last few weeks with getting our kids center downtown ready. And really, if you're among those who show up week after week after week for a serve team on a Sunday or during the week, thank you for being part of what makes church possible. So we have one more Sunday at this building on Warden Run Road, and then on Easter Sunday, April 17th, we're moving services back downtown to the Capitol Theater and to our new Kids Center. So be thinking about who you can invite to the Easter service and then invite them and plan to come and meet them there. Well, today we're gonna hear from Jen Lewis as we continue our series, Fearless. So let's enjoy some time in worship and then we'll hear from Jen.
Well, hi, everyone. Good to see you. I don't really see you, but I'm glad you see me. I'm glad you're tuning in today. We are moving through our series on fear, and um, today we're going to talk specifically about the fear of the wilderness, and I'll explain that as we go along. There are common thoughts and ideas and even emotions that can drive an entire culture that can kind of weave their way into the background, into the subconscious of an entire community. I've heard it said that that you can't really explain water to a fish. Now, obviously you can't because a fish has a brain the size of a needle, you know, a pin needle or pin point or whatever. But my point is, We are swimming in thoughts and swimming in ideas as we go through our daily lives that we don't even realize are impacting us. And one of those specific ideas that are impacting us today is the value we have on comfort and safety. If we don't stop and kind of think about how these different ideas and these different values in our culture impact us, we will not be able to kind of catch ourselves when we have unbiblical views based more on the emotions and the ideas of the culture and less on what scripture says and what God has to say. And today what I want to look at is I want to look at this idea of how our culture, and really honestly, I feel like we've seen it all across the world. I don't even know if it's just our culture, but this priority of comfort and safety. We fear so much being uncomfortable. We fear so much going through difficulties and going through hardships that we will compromise on important things. We will, we will go to extreme places in our behavior so that we can avoid discomfort, so that we can stay safe. You know, sometimes we will choose not to speak truth, even though we know something is true because we don't want to offend anybody because that would be uncomfortable. Sometimes we won't discipline our kids enough or we won't say no to them because they'll be uncomfortable and we don't want them mad at us because that would make us uncomfortable. Or or sometimes the opposite happens and we say no to our kids all the time. Because if we said yes to them, it would put them in a risky situation where they might not be safe or they may fail or they may be uncomfortable. And that's scary. That's that's not what we want to do. And so sometimes we hold our kids actually too close to us. Sometimes we take part in things that we know aren't good for us, that we that we know very well um, are are. are potentially going to destroy different parts of our lives, but we do it because it numbs the discomfort in our lives. You know, we think about some people will go toward taking medication when they don't need it or drinking alcohol or taking part in some kind of addictive behavior. I mean, I know I have one guy friend that he plays video games all the time because he is avoiding the discomfort in his life. Some of us stare at aimlessly at social media and our computers for hours on end so that we don't have to be uncomfortable with what we are dealing with in our lives. Sometimes we will just avoid people and avoid conversations, even if those people are good people and good influences in our lives, but we don't want to have to deal with the discomfort that whatever it is they're, they're you know, bringing to the table might make us uncomfortable. And we do all this because we have elevated comfort and safety to to a place of of, uh, being an idol in our lives. We want to avoid pain at almost any cost. But the truth is constant comfort is elusive. It's not something that God has ever promised us here on earth. And it's definitely not something that we can attain all the time. But we fear the pain of living in this fallen and broken world. Now, oftentimes people of faith will describe, you know, hardship or going through times of trouble as the wilderness season in your life. And so that's kind of what we're going to do today. We're going to, we're going to actually look back 
at a real life story about a group of people called the Israelites who went through a season of wilderness. And we're gonna do that to kind of prepare ourselves for the fact that we will face seasons that are difficult. No matter how much we try to avoid difficulty in our lives, those times are going to come. We live in a broken and fallen world and we are all broken and fallen. And we serve a God who, by his grace and mercy, has allowed us to have choices in this world. And when you allow a broken and fallen people inside a broken and fallen world to have choices, there will be difficulty. I mean, you know, we could think that for the last several years, life has become a whole lot easier for us who live in countries like the United States, where there's all kinds of conveniences But even with all those conveniences that have been invented and created over the past, you know, hundred years or so, the whole world could not avoid the pain that we have just gone through with COVID. Even in our attempts to avoid a wilderness season, we still had to walk through it. And the truth is, is that as we continue to move forward in our lives, we will go through times as individuals where we will go through wilderness seasons. And so we're going to look at the Israelites today and we're going to see what we can learn from them to help us be prepared for those times in our lives so that we're not afraid of them, but so we see them as opportunities to grow and and opportunities to learn and to be more like God in the process. Now, if you're not familiar with the Israelites in the wilderness, I'm going to do my best to catch you up today. But really to get the full picture of the Israelites and their story, I would suggest you go back and you read Genesis and Exodus. They're the two first books of the Bible. And and they tell, I mean, there's so many good details that we're going to skip over today. But if you're not familiar with these stories, go back and read Genesis and Exodus so you can find out all the history behind what I'm going to talk about today. First, we're going to start in the book of Exodus, and we're going to look at um, the people that God, that God chose called the Israelites. Now, they are descended from a man named Abraham, and they were initially a nomadic group of people who just kind of, you know, had their cattle and, and everything else that they needed long, long ago, and they traveled around to look for the best pasture land. But eventually, there came a famine, And there's all kinds of details, which I won't get into, but they ended up going to Egypt because Egypt had food. And so they went there and they stayed and initially they were welcome. But as the years went on and as they grew as a, as a people, people very numerous in size and millions of people, um, the Pharaoh decided to enslave them. And so the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. And then God rose up a man named Moses to come and deliver them. And he went to Pharaoh and basically there's this whole long story, but he says, let my people go. And he wants, you know, God to, to, or he, God wants Pharaoh to let the Israelites go and be free. Well, Pharaoh I mean, hello, he has millions of people as his workforce for free. He's no dummy. And he says, no. And so God ends up performing all these different miracles, these 10 plagues to finally break down Pharaoh to the point where he finally says, okay, I relent, you can go. And he sends the Israelites out into the desert and they are freed to go because ultimately God's going to free them from slavery and take them into what he calls the promised land. And it's a land that they describe as flowing with milk and honey and it's fabulous and it has wonderful fruit and wonderful pasture land and it'll be a great place to live. So in the meantime, they're on their way. They get released. And we're going to pick up in Exodus 13. It says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, If they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. So God's planning to take them to this wonderful place, but he knows that the shortest route would lead them into a battle that they're not prepared for. And so he takes them around a longer way in order to keep them safe in the meantime. It's a protection because they're not ready for what they would face if they go the straight way. Now skip to Exodus 14. So in Exodus 14, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi-Harioth between Bigdol and the sea. 
They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Now, I don't know if I pronounced all those names correctly or not, but basically what happens is God takes him on this, this longer route and then says to turn a different direction. And where they end up going is a valley. So there's mountains on this side, mountains on this side, and the Red Sea in front of them. They're basically walking into a trap. And then out of nowhere, Pharaoh and the Egyptians are like, hey, wait a minute, we don't want them to leave. They change their minds and the Egyptian army comes chasing after the Israelites. Well, at this point, they're in this valley and they've got water in front of them, the Egyptian army behind them and mountains on the side. They're trapped. But God explained why he did it. In Exodus 14, it says, Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. So they cooperate. But meanwhile, they're concerned. We're in a trap. The Egyptians are following. What are we going to do? Now you would think, They just saw the 10 plagues happen. They just saw God miraculously free them from slavery. You would think that they would be like, all right, God, what do you got for us? No, this is what happens. Verse 10, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, as as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. The deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So the Israelites are freaking out a bit. Moses says, calm down. God's got this. And he does. He tells Moses to put a staff in the Red Sea, which he does. And then the sea parts. The Israelites are able to walk through on dry ground to safety on the other side. And once they get to the other side and the Egyptian army is in that that interlude spot where the water's on either side, God just releases the water back into place and he drowns the entire, destroys the entire Egyptian army before, before them. Absolutely amazing. I mean, before they were just released and they were like, okay, we'll see how long this goes. We'll see what happens. Well, now Pharaoh's army is completely destroyed. They are completely freed from the bondage and the tyranny of their enslavement. It was a miracle. And so they end up, we see in Exodus 15, they end up writing this praise song that tells the whole story and they're, they're celebrating and they're dancing and they write this song so they never forget what God did for them. Well, if we get too confident in the steadfastness of people and humanity, we got to pick up in verse 22. It says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? So how long, did you see how long they were walking? Three days, three days. They had seen the 10 plagues. They had seen water split in two and the Egyptian army destroyed three days before. And they start complaining. We have no water. We can't do this. We, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Now, granted, if we start to think that we are holier than thou and can look back with our 2020 vision, you go three days without seeing new sources of water, you start to get nervous every time you drink from the water you brought. So they were, I mean, they were probably starting to feel the effects. Now they had some water with them. They didn't leave with only like the clothes on the back or anything. They had supplies with them, but those supplies were dwindling every day. And so they saw that and they got very, very uncomfortable. They felt unsafe. They had forgotten quickly what all God had done. 
Now, it's amazing because God ends up using Moses in this moment as well. That handy dandy staff he had, God used it, said you hit that rock. And when he hit the rock, this wonderful, sweet tasting water, pure, wonderful, cool water came spilling out and everybody had enough water to drink. Okay, so, so far we've seen all these miraculously, miraculous things happen. Then we get to Exodus 16. It says, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died in the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Talk about dramatic. These guys knew what to say and how to complain. At this point, it's probably been 30 to 40 days. They've been out for about a month. Now, remember, they did not just leave with the clothes on their back. They had cattle with them. They had supplies with them. The Egyptians had given them stuff as they left. That's how amazing God's miracles were with the 10 plagues. But anyway, still, it's the same as it is with the water. If we think about this, all their supplies are starting to dwindle. They're in the desert. They may see the occasional, you know, little rodent or something in the desert, but it wasn't like they could find lots and lots of sources of food. And they were getting nervous. They were getting uncomfortable. And they began to complain. And not just complain. They were wishing that they were still enslaved again. They were wishing that they were dead. This is how much we as humans hate to be uncomfortable. We hate it. We hate it. We would rather be dead and enslaved than uncomfortable. So stop and just take a moment here. There are things in our lives that we take part in in order to keep comfortable. Things that enslave us. Things that bring us spiritual death. You know, we've talked about some of this already. It could be as simple as scrolling on Instagram and wasting half your day away. Or it could be as extreme as succumbing to an addiction. But do not fool yourself into thinking this is not a big deal when you do this. When you numb yourself in this way, you oftentimes are choosing enslavement, are choosing spiritual death over discomfort. So back to the story. They're hungry. They're uncomfortable. We've got to understand that to a certain extent. And they grumble and they complain. And so God in his grace, in his compassion, in his mercy, he sends down manna. And manna, we're not really sure what it is. In fact, the name literally means what's that. But it was like this grain-like substance that would appear on the ground like dew in the morning. And they would use it to eat it. Apparently it was like a superfood. And they just were nourished their whole time through the desert with this food that God provided every single morning. Every morning they would wake up and he would have enough there for them for that day. It was miraculous. And so with all the things we've already seen that he's done miraculously, miraculously, every single day they saw his provision again and again and again. And then they'd wake up and again they would see it. And then I should add, on top of all this, we didn't even read this section, but God has been leading them through the desert miraculously as well. They were to follow a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. So they didn't even have to wonder, like, has he left us? What are we supposed to do? No, they'd look up in the sky. If they saw the cloud move, they would follow the cloud. Or if they saw the pillar of fire move, they'd they'd pack up all their stuff and they'd follow the pillar of fire. It was miraculous too. And this went on for about a year. And then they got to the base of this mountain. You probably have heard of it before. It's called the Mount Mount Sinai. And it's where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and all of his rules for living. Now, a lot of times we think that, that God gave Moses ten rules and that was it. And that's not it. 
God gave Moses 10 rules, but then 10 commandments, but then he also gave them all these ceremonial rules and dietary laws and, and um, kind of societal laws on how to best live. And we can look back at this. As, if you look in the book of Leviticus, you see a lot of it detailed out. Um, and, and it's complicated, but it also is a picture. It helps us, if you read that and you study that, it helps us to understand the sacrificial um, atonement or the sacrificial a payment that Jesus pays later on. So it, it helps us. It, it prepares us as humans to understand what God was going to do. And it also, it's, it's really fascinating because some of the stuff, now that we understand germs and sanitation and, and now that we understand like what foods are good for us and how you need to cook certain foods and things like that, like you look back and you're like, oh, God was like coaching them through germs and they didn't even realize it, you know? So, so there was, it was really pretty powerful. Anyway, at the bottom of Mount Sinai, God gives Moses, he tells Moses, I want you to gather all the people. I'm going to give you the rules for living. So they all gather at the bottom of this mountain and God comes to the top of the mountain and there's fire and there's smoke billowing and there's thunder and there's lightning. And there's some debate about whether the Israelites heard the actual voice of God or not. But either way, they saw this amazing encounter with the power of God. And, they, and Moses gets the 10 commandments. Well, after he gets the 10 commandments, the Israelites again are freaking out. It says this, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself. We will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Okay, to be in the presence of God in that awesome way had to be a little uncomfortable and they didn't want it. They wanted Moses to do the hard work. So Moses said to the people, do, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. So he says this, and then Moses goes up the mountain to get the rest of the details. He had first gotten the Ten Commandments. Now he was getting all the other, you know, dietary laws, societal laws, all that kind of stuff. And it took him about a month. It took him, you know, a while. And what happened was the Israelites did the exact thing that God told them not to do. At the beginning of the Ten Commandments, he says, do not have any gods before me. At the very end, before Moses goes up to hear the rest of the details, he says, don't let them make gods of silver or gold to me. And what do they do? They gather up all the gold they collected and brought from Egypt, and they melt it down into the shape of a calf, and they worship it. They do the exact opposite of what God told them. I mean, they do the very thing God told them not to do. They tried to fix things on their own. They were impatient. They didn't know where Moses went. They didn't know what was happening. So God sees all this and he says, Moses, go down, deal with your people. Moses goes down, sees what they're doing, and he's furious. He throws down the tablets that had all written all the rules on it that God had given him. And he, he is just furious. And people died. Some people repented and they lived. Other people died in the desert. It was a mess. And then God's mercy comes and, and, and everything kind of calms down and, and, and they move on. Now, God wanted them to spend about a year in the desert. He was ready to bring them into the promised land. He had brought them through some difficulties. He had tested them. They had continued to fail in his grace and mercy. He had continued to sustain them. And now we get to the point where he wants to bring them into the promised land. So he goes to Moses and he says, okay, I want you to take one man from each tribe of Israel and I want you to send them into the promised land. I want them to see what I'm giving you. And so he sends these 12 men in, each from each of the tribes of Israel. There's 12 of them. And they come back, 10 of them scared out of their minds, 
all of them reporting that it's fabulous, first of all, bringing back huge pieces of fruit and describing it as a wonderful place. But 10 of them are like, there's no way we could do this. We can't beat these people. They're big. Their cities are fortified. It's horrible. But there's two guys who are like, wait, wait, wait. Remember all he's done. Remember his faithfulness. Remember the plagues. Remember the Red Sea. Remember the water. Remember the, the manna and the quail, which I didn't even tell you about, and all the other things. Well, the Israelites don't listen to the two. They listen to the 10. And it says this in Numbers, or no, I'm sorry. Yes, it says this in Numbers 14. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to the land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Let us choose somebody other than God to give us something we want, to give us something we're not scared of, to make us comfortable. Let's go back to the familiar. Let's go back to what we know. Even though we know it's not good for us, even though we know it's not best for us, let's choose somebody else to follow other than God. Well, it's the end. I mean, it's as if God is like, I, I, I'm done. I wash my hands of you. I am done. And he's going to just destroy them all. And Moses goes to, the, goes to God and pleads and begs for mercy on behalf of these people. Now, let me just say, Moses is such a future picture of Jesus. He's not perfect and he has his own stuff and he doesn't end up going into the promised land himself. But he's such a picture of the Jesus that is to come, the Jesus who will take us out of our slavery, the Jesus who will intercede for us on our behalf. It's such a beautiful picture. Well, anyway, God listens to Moses. He doesn't destroy them all. He, he, he shows grace, grace and compassion, but he does, does still let them live in the consequences of their sin. It says in verse 20, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. Not one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because of my servant Caleb, this is one of the two that get to go, that were, the, were fine with going in. They were the ones who were like, no, no, we can do this. Anyway, he has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. So he says to them, okay. I wanted to get you through the desert in a year, about a year. We're not going to do that because apparently you aren't going to obey. So you're going to go into the desert for 40 years. And no one who was in Egypt, no one who saw the 10 plagues, no one who saw the Red Sea will get to see the promised land. There are consequences for this. What was meant to be a year in the wilderness lasted 40 years. And for most of them, it, it meant they did not get to experience the promised land. So what can we learn from this? Because these stories were preserved for us to learn who God is and to learn who we as humans are. And so what can we learn from this? First of all, we know we fear the wilderness. We know we fear hard times. But sometimes we fear things because we're not prepared for them. So let's prepare ourselves. Let's look at this. And knowing that our situation is not going to be the desert in the Middle East, but it's going to be something else, how do we, knowing that our tendencies are like the Israelites' tendencies, because all humans, we are all broken and fallen, what can we learn? First takeaway is this, don't assume the wilderness is your fault. Don't assume that going through a hard time is because you sinned along the way. 
trust me, you've sinned. Trust me, we've all screwed up. But the hardship you're going through may not be because of that. You know, if you think about the beginning of the Israelites' experience, they were in the wilderness. He was freeing them from slavery. It was just hard to free them from slavery. Like it, it required some things. It required the longer route. And then to truly be freed, to truly destroy the Egyptian army, he had to take them into the valley where they felt like they were trapped, ultimately so that he could wipe out the Egyptians. That was hard, but that wasn't their fault. That was just a part of the freedom process. That was a part of what needed to happen. God was preparing them for what was ahead. If they weren't prepared and ready for the battle, he took them for a longer route. And then in the process, he did a miracle that seemed difficult, facing the Red Sea and being surrounded by the army behind them. But God provided for them. It wasn't their fault. Sometimes God is just getting us ready for the next thing, or he's getting ready to show us something amazing. Now, sometimes we're caught in the consequences of other people's sin. It's not your fault you're in a hardship, but somebody you love or somebody near you or somebody around you made a decision that now you have to live the consequences of. You know, I think about troubled marriages where one spouse is at fault for a lot of what's going on in the relationship, although... I think sometimes we like to always say it's the other person's fault. But anyway, I mean, think about the case of Joshua and Caleb. They were the two of the 12 who said, no, remember, we can do this with God. They still had to go through the desert for 40 years with the rest of their people. They were living with the consequences of others. And when that happens, when hardships come like that in our lives, we've got to trust that God still sees us that he is an efficient God who will not waste the pain we're in, that he will use it to prepare us and make us more ready for whatever that promised land is that's coming. Number two, sometimes the wilderness is your fault. Sometimes you screw up royally enough that the hardship is your fault, that you are living with the consequences of your disobedience. God made it clear that the Israelites had to spend 40 years in the desert because they continually failed over and over and over again, disobedient, forgetting all that God had done, totally choosing to say, we're going to choose somebody else over God, forming and fashioning an idol. Now we may not think we do that because we're not melting down gold in the shape of a calf, but we put things ahead of God all kinds of times, you know? I mean, it can be our will, it can be our schedule, it can be, you know, our timeline. If we don't like the timeline that God has, then we choose to skip a few things that we know we shouldn't skip in order to get where we want to go. And ultimately, this can lead us into a wilderness time that lasts longer than it has to last. God wants us to teach the lessons from hardship so that we can move on to the better things. But sometimes in our ignorance, in our rebellion, in our brokenness, we miss it. Which leads me to my next takeaway. When you're going through the wilderness, keep following God. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't stop following him. Don't stop looking to him. The Israelites had that cloud by day and the pillar of fire at night. They also had all of his instructions after they went to Mount Sinai. We have those same instructions plus a whole bunch of other great revelation that God has given us. We have the Holy Spirit, which they did not have individually at that point. We as believers in Christ have been given in these the time since Jesus rose from the dead. We have access to the Holy Spirit who will guide us and direct us. We have our church family who will help to counsel us along the way. We are not left to our own devices when we feel like we're going through a hard time, when we know we're going through a hard, a hard time. God will not leave us. He will not forsake us. And even if the wilderness is our fault, we can trust that God's still there, that he is still with us. You know, um, in the book of Nehemiah, which is several books past what I just shared with you, there was a leader named Nehemiah, the book's named after him. But anyway, he was describing this specific time in history of the Israelites. And I want you to listen to his perspective of it. 
He's talking to God and he says, because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. By day, the pillar of cloud did not fail to guide them on their path, not the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths and you gave them water for their thirst. For 40 years, you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and nor did their feet become swollen. God miraculously sustained them, even in their discipline, even in their punishment. God was walking with them, providing for them, having compassion on them, sustaining them, loving them. But when things get tough, we, like the, like the Israelites, want to turn back. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to what's familiar. We want to go back to slavery, the slavery of sin. And we stop looking to God. We stop trusting him. We forget his goodness. But in those moments that are difficult, we cannot give up. We got to keep going. We cannot turn back. We've got to keep looking at him, leaning into him. Because there's something, if he's allowing this in our lives, there is something we can learn from it. There is something we can gain from it. And there are times, actually, when obeying God is actually going to take you into a wilderness. It might take you into persecution. It may take you into difficulty. But I would say still, we are called to do it. So many times we're, we're tempted to compromise because again, we love our comfort. We love our safety. It's too hard. It's too uncomfortable. It, it's not worth it. And so in order to hold on to that comfort and that safety at all costs, we are tempted to stop following him. But as people of faith, we have to commit to the fact that we will not turn away that we will follow him, that we will trust him more than we fear the hardship. We will trust him. You know, maybe you're in a wilderness season in your marriage and it just seems so hard. You just want to quickly just get out of it. You don't want to do the hard work of counseling or the hard work of forgiveness or the hard work of fidelity. But God says, no, follow me. Maybe school's tough and you, you know, you're tempted to cheat on a paper or cheat on an exam or just quit the whole thing altogether. But God has something for you in that difficulty and in that trial. Maybe you're in a relationship and you know what? It's just so much more convenient to stay the night. It's just so much more convenient to let the physical aspect of the relationship just go the way it would naturally go. It's cheaper to live together. It's cheaper to compromise in that area. And, and it's more convenient. It's more comfortable. But God says, no, I love you. And I know what is best for you. And if you would only follow me and follow my timeline, you will see my faithfulness, my provision, my compassion. You know, you look back at the Israelites and God gave them so many chances, so many chances. But ultimately, they got more time in the wilderness because they refused to follow. They refused to trust that his ways were best. And their wilderness got harder and was longer than it ever had to be. Do not fool yourself into thinking that you know better than the God of the universe. Because in reality, when you think you're preserving comfort, when you disobey God, you go into dangerous territory. When you go outside of his will, you are no longer under his favor. And that protective umbrella of his grace is no longer covering you. You've got to keep following God. And number four, Remember God's goodness. The Israelites' biggest problem is that they kept forgetting. They wrote a song, but apparently they did not put it on repeat, and they were not singing it long enough. We have got to remember the goodness of God. We have stories like this to remind us, but we have the cross. We have the stories of Jesus we have his example. We realize that he sacrificed himself for us. That while we were sinners, while we were enslaved to sin, he died for us. 
He wanted to make a way for us to have an ultimate eternity that will not have the hardship, that will not have wilderness, that will not have discomfort. But we've got to trust him in the process in the meantime until we get there. And we've got to do that by remembering who he is and what he has done. That all those things we don't deserve, that he continues to provide for us over and over and over again. Every morning when we wake up and his grace is new. We cannot forget. And if we remember, he will see us to the other side. And there will be a day when those hardships will end. There will be a day when there will be no more crying and no more tears. So do not be afraid. Take heart. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the stories that we get to learn from. I thank you that you are our hero, you are our deliverer, you are our redeemer, that you have made a way for us through this difficult life and that ultimately there is eternal life full of pleasures evermore. And it is available to us through your son. So Father, I pray that we would remember that, we would be mindful of that and that we would not be afraid of the difficulties that will come in this life because we will keep in mind what is in store for us in heaven. Lord, have your way in our hearts and our minds that we would be able to throw off the fear that so easily entangles us and run this race well. In Jesus' name, amen. Does it ever feel like it's hard to remember God's goodness? Do you ever struggle to know he's still with you and that he's still for your best? Well, this is something that's kind of overwhelming. We don't want you to feel alone or even stuck in that place. So I want to let you know about a ministry the Vineyard offers called Stephen Ministry. And Stephen Ministry is made up of people from all walks of life who are part of the Vineyard, and they've gone through extensive training to come alongside others who might benefit from having a person with a Christian perspective kind of walk things out in life. So it's done in a very private and confidential way. And if this is something you think you might benefit from, you can let us know that by going to the website, clicking on the connect with us link, and then use the connect card link. There's a spot on that connect card that says, I'm interested in a Stephen minister coming alongside me. So if you check the little box next to that, we'll be in touch with you and get you connected with a Stephen minister. And you know, in general, in this world, we can become saturated with the stuff of this world from when we wake up and you know pick up our phone until we set it down at night and finally close our eyes, the stuff of the world can overcome us and seem to be an overwhelming reality. And we barely can find good, God's goodness in that sometimes just because the world is so crazy. And as Jen said, sometimes it's not something we choose, it's more a situation we find ourselves in. Sometimes it is our fault. We've made choices and now we're living with the consequence, but each day we get to choose. Each day we can choose to turn our thoughts, literally redirect our minds to the truth we have about God's unchanging presence and relentless desire for us to know him, to draw close to him, to literally walk with him like he offered those Israelites. And, and this can make all the difference. Each day that we put God off, it's another day added to our wandering in that wilderness, Jen talked about. But the moment that you, you make that choice to turn to God, it's a step away from wandering in that wilderness to a journey of new perspective and new life with God, even in this world. So here's an idea. Tomorrow and then each day you wake up this week, just try beginning your day, like before your feet hit the ground, before you pick up your phone or turn on the TV or check the weather or tell Alexa what to play or however you start your day, before you do that, try to first, like in those first moments of the new day, simply acknowledge God's presence and ask him to help you journey through your day, keeping your mind on him.